Hello, good evening and welcome. I'm Karima Brown and you're watching Political Exchange where we unpack Africa's political economy. Africa, particularly the women of Africa, scored big recently with the appointment of former Deputy President of South Africa, Pumzile Mlambo Nguga, to the position of Executive Director of UN Women. She's also, of course, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations, and she's my special guest tonight on Political Exchange. Thank you so much for joining us, and congratulations. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you, Karima. From Deputy President of South Africa to Head of UN Women, a very, very prestigious prestigious post. Of course, African women celebrating your achievements as an achievement of all of us, in mm -hmm. a sense, on the mm -hmm. continent. Mm -hmm. What do you think, uh, Pumzile, um, is the defining character of um, the person that needs to occupy the seminal post, given the centrality of multilateral fora such as the UN, particularly as it concerns the global plight of women today? Well, if one considers that uh every facet of life, uh, all aspects of the work that United Nations do impact on women. If you think that more than half of the people on the globe are women, that's a lot of people that the UN governments and different institutions have to, to serve. But uh, the job is obviously concerned about the improvement of the quality of life of those women who do not have a uh, a meaningful life, uh, who live in poverty. So I think the defining features of this job, the team, not just the head, is the concern for the poor. And because the face of poverty has a woman's face. Mm -hmm. So finding an entry point into this job that goes directly to the aspects of poverty and the systemic nature of uh, poverty that impacts women and then deal systematically with those uh, uh, impediments. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the issues that often the UN gets as a critique of its work um, is the fact that it has a very good um, diagnostic abilities. It has the ability to tell us what's wrong with the condition of women, whether it's the feminization of poverty, disease, and so on. But its ability to get by in on implementation is often where it falls down, like many other mm -hmm. institutions such as the UN. Mm -hmm. The position that you occupy and the lack of executive power. Is that something you're seeking to change, uh, given the fact that you need commitments you know, beyond words? Well, yes, I'm hoping that uh, the fact that the General Secretary himself has told me that this is a critical position for him. Mm -hmm. This is critical that the women who are poor, and he highlighted Africa um, as a continent that needs to get relief, uh, adds into the instruments that one can have to make meaningful difference. I would not like to be a token. That's really not who I am. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to get in there and do things that can be destiny changing for mm -hmm. women. Because if we cannot use the governments that make up the UN to facilitate change, God forbid, mm -hmm. you know. So, and I, I am not saying this light because I know it is not easy. I have both idealism and realism about what needs to be done, but I will uh, do all that I can to facilitate consensus on concrete things, not on statements, mm -hmm. not, not just on policy, because there's already a lot of, of policy. Very good policy. There's a lot of, there's a strategic plan, which I think is very comprehensive, mm -hmm. that has already been adopted for this institution. So we need to really get on with the implementation. If, if I'm understanding you correctly, Pumzile, you're not seeking to reinvent the wheel. You want to get hit the ground running. You want to implement. Yes, I don't have. The, we don't have the time as women, as as institutions. But I also uh, do not want to put myself in a situation where I cannot change anything. Right. Uh, for instance, I would love to give education of women and girls a higher profile in the program. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, it is included there to some extent because MDGs are a concern of this institution, but I would like even to lift it, uh, not just as part of what is in the MDGs. But as in, it to the top? Yes, no, absolutely, because mm -hmm. I think it's the biggest intervention that we could have if we were to address the systemic 
oppression of women. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the, the question around resources is often mm. an issue, even yes. for bodies such as the UN. Mm. Uh, bodies are often cash-strapped. Mm. Um, mm. How are you going to deal with resource questions um, around particularly programs on the ground? We've seen in the global economic crisis, many countries, including leading economies in the United States, in the EU, um, cutting down on funding and aid. And of course we know women are often the first groups of people that are impacted negatively when crunches like this hit. Where's the money going to come from? Well, in a strange way, there's a lot of money in the world, some of it even stranded. So we obviously need to be very smart about how we go and seek those resources. On one end, we need to pursue governments so that they can uh, meet their obligations to the UN because uh, in part this is funded by the contributions of governments and uh, from what I have been told there is room for more from governments. Uh, on the other hand there is very limited private sector investment in women. This for me is a relatively a new area. I know that my predecessor and the team there has been working on that. They do have some, some insights, but I think together we can be a bit more aggressive about how we facilitate investment of private. And I want to say investment, yes, because this is not just about charity, this is yes. about investing in a better world. This is interesting for me that you, you speak to the question of the private sector, mm. particularly in global yes, institutions yes. and governance. We've often held um, elected leaders to account, but yes. very often capital and private sector investment um, do not come to the party on the global mm. you know, mm. scale, and often their interventions are charitable rather yes, than empowering. Yes, yes. How are you going to ensure that you make the investment case mm. for the education, the empowerment of women, particularly those women that many feel are unbankable, yes. that don't make commercial sense? I think we have got is the uh, UN women to ensure that there isn't mission dilute when we receive uh, investment uh, from partners. We must make sure that we direct the funds where we really know that the funds will create uh, ripple effects mm -hmm. and will have an impact. We shouldn't be accepting uh, donations that will just be a marketing exercise without really going directly to the issues that matter for women. There is obviously areas where uh, if we talk about health and, and the social sector, there isn't returns in the classical, mm -hmm. classical context. But actually investing in women's health, in women's education, you are increasing markets. Absolutely. But also, I mean, we see innovations in things like, um, you know, micro banking, yes. the Grameen Bank, for exactly. example. Exactly. We're talking about rural women and development where assets of even the very poor yes. are able to be leveraged um, in economies of scale. Is there a particular public-private sector partnership model that you'd like to follow? I, I don't have it all in my mind worked out. And I'm hoping that with the collaboration of some experts and, right. and, and people who have studied these issues much more than, 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 I, than I have, uh, I would be able to, 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 to crack it. But mm -hmm. that's exactly where I, I am going. I think that I want to make my division to be a division of partners. Right. I mean, my experience here in South Africa of working in Gypsa, for right. instance, even though it was short term, as the presidency, we hardly spent anything to create. You were Gypsum. able to get investment. I was able to leverage partnerships with companies, both South African but mostly international, that hundreds and hundreds of women at the cost of those companies were able to get exposure to different opportunities around the world which were career changing for mm -hmm. them. And even today when I meet people who are part of that program and they tell me where they are and what a moment in their own career development that exposure was, I'm like, wow, yeah. if I think that government hardly had to spend anything. So it must make sense to the, to the women, as, right. as, as we were trying to do in the, in the context of Jibsa. But it also, uh, obviously, must also make sense to the people who are investing in the sense that they must see that these returns will have a long-lasting impact 
in the in the quality of life of the women and the communities that we're targeting. Let's just move a little bit quickly to the architecture of the United Nations. Mm. There's often a call for reform around mm. the UN. Mm. Um, a lot of the architecture of the UN, particularly at its security mm. arms, um, is designed for a world and an era gone by. Mm. The world is changing, mm. you have very big economies um, in the developing mm. world emerging. Mm. To what extent, Pumzile, are you going to recalibrate UN women to speak to the changing conditions of women, particularly women in the developing world, in places like Africa, in places like Asia, uh, Latin America, for example? Well, uh, one or oh, some of the themes for this job include women in leadership and participation, and participation across the board. So to the extent that uh, the shape and structure and the impact of the, of, of the UN it requires also women to participate and to have an, an, an input. I would also be interested in encouraging women f from the perspective of their own countries at a global level right. mo to, to motivate them to actually ha take a, a role and see that they have got a stake in a UN that works for women. Mm -hmm. I'm also, uh, we also have a theme uh, of peace uh, as well as violence against women at a domestic level, as well as uh, violence against women in places of war and in, in areas of conflict. That also is another area where I see an important role for women. In some countries where, where women, where there has been wars, women have been known to play a critical stabilizing role. That should also be seen at a UN level. Sierra Leone, for instance, the women played such a significant role in that country in moving from a, a war talk country to the country that it is today. Talking about the fact that women play a seminal role and that you want to focus on women in conflict, let's take the current conflict in Egypt yeah. as we see. Women have been, as a social group, mm. targeted mm. specifically. Mm. The attacks, particularly mm. the sexual violence perpetrated mm. against mm. women, looks highly organized, mm. planned, mm. calculated. Mm. Um, as head of UN Women, um, what is your response to what is happening to the women, whether it is as protesters or people on the streets, whether they are in the pro or against Mursi, um, you know, mm. mass demonstrations and mm. formations, mm. Um, particularly in light of the fact that the UN itself has been quite ambivalent mm. and ambiguous mm. about whether there was or not, uh, you know, a coup in, in the removal of Karen, Mohammed Mursi. Whether this was a coup or not. Violence against women. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. The, you know, there are some things where there isn't a gray area. When someone is being raped, there is no gray area. There is no rationale for this kind of violence. Even if the women were not specifically targeted, even if it was sporadic that certain groups, it's even worse when one begins to feel that it could even be organized. So for me, these are the things that I think are, are very uh, dehumanizing. But also, I think uh, these are the things that hit women and discourage them from being activists. Thankfully, though, there is enough determination amongst women, even in these areas where there are conflicts, to soldier on. And the last thing that you could do, not just as the UN, but as the women of the world, is not to be there to support them. So one of the things that I I'm, 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 I'm really would want to focus on is collaboration and mo mobilizing partnership. As South Africa, I know what solidarity South yes. African, I know what solidarity can do, and I think that there is a death of of uh, activism, uh, women's movement, uh, that that kind of mass participation in, in in issues like this, and I would hope that uh, one could collaborate with the women's organization at a sub-regional level, right. at a national level, in order for the UN to have partners and to rely on the partners, and I don't want to sound like I'm reinventing wheel because yes. I know that work has been done, these organizations exist, but how could we just leverage them stronger in order to make sure that uh, we can lean on them uh, to address these issues that you address? Because if one has to make an impact in a country like Egypt, I guess mobilizing women in the Middle East, not just the women in Egypt, but also making sure that that is linked up to a much global network of women. And of course also le leveraging the women in Africa. Oh, yeah. Of course we will be talking more about your relationship with the AU mm. chairperson mm. Kozazana Damini mm. Zuma.